Reading from Colossians, the first chapter, verses 3 to 14. It's on page 1182 in the Bibles. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people. The faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing good fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This is God's word. How's your prayer life? That's the question that almost guarantees Christians to start feeling uncomfortable. Yet we're in this summer series of the Apostle Paul's prayers to encourage us and not to condemn us. And today, as we look at this particular prayer in Colossians chapter one, I'm going to call this a prayer for more. Now, some might hear that title and think, yeah, I'd go along with that. More money, more things, more holidays. But the Bible tells us never to pray for things like that. Rather, in fact, the opposite is true. We hear the Lord saying, because money and things and leisure can be a snare to us, a hindrance to drawing near to God and walking with him, with his purposes in mind. Now, before we look at this prayer in detail, we'll look at some of the background to all this. Who is it written to? Well, Paul wrote this letter to the Colossians, uh, that is the church in Colossae, while he was imprisoned, quite probably in, in Rome, in the year, or around the year, 62 AD. And it's believed that the church was established as a result of Epaphras hearing Paul preach and teach in Ephesus around seven or eight years earlier. Sometimes this Epaphras is called Epaphroditus, which is his full name. And he responded in faith to the gospel message. And then he went back to Colossae, which is about 100 miles away, where he was from. He went back there as a new Christian and then he set up a fellowship there, established a church there. So glory to God, really. You know, from tiny seeds, just this one man converted. And yet now with the power of God, moving him and leading him. And at work in many other people as well. A whole church is brought into being. No matter that the Apostle Paul hasn't met these believers in Colossae. Epaphras has told Paul how things are going. That's really important, isn't it? He's told Paul about their faith in Jesus and their love for all Christians that was clearly in them through the Holy Spirit. 
For this reason, Paul says in Colossians 1 verse 9, for this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. And that's some examples to follow, isn't it? It's great to pray for someone, especially if you pray immediately after you hear of the need or the reason to thank the Lord. But Paul and Timothy are not just praying once, but they're praying continually for them. What do they pray? What do they pray? They are asking God to fill the Colossians with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Knowing what God wants us to do as his people in a hostile and a godless society is crucial. And the main way of knowing God's will is through the Bible. Every Christian needs to realise that. Feed on his word every day. We make time to eat food every day, don't we? And we must make time to look into and feed on God's word. Read, feed, feast on his word, yes. But that's not all. That's not all. Because notice Paul says in verse 9, asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Spiritual. At that time in Colossae, all sorts of people peddled intriguing ideologies and folk religion was rife. And they were man's ideas, not God's. They weren't from the Holy Spirit. And sometimes in our 21st Western culture, especially in what we call reformed churches, being a believer in Christ can come across as something quite academic. We're not just reading the Bible a lot, but we're constantly being recommended books, uh, perhaps by Don Carson, R.C. Sproul, Tim Keller, Spurgeon, J.C. Ryle, maybe from long ago, the Puritans. And I'm not against you reading any of the authors I've just spoken about, but let's remember something of vital importance, that all this is spiritual work. So yes, God uses our minds and our wills, but he is spirit, the Bible tells us. We must come to him, and worship him, and live for him in spirit and in truth. So we read not to stuff our brains with information. We read to let God have his perfect way in our lives. When we're born anew, born again, it is our spirits that were dead. that He is now made alive. What was dead and unresponsive to him has now come alive. We're able to be guided and moved by the leading of his Holy Spirit. So Paul and Timothy pray, asking God to fill the Colossian believers with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And just like today, where we have different groups who say we have to include the Bible amongst our holy books, but we need other things and not just the Bible. They say we need new ideas and new thoughts. And so often we do want something new. We desire new things in our lives. And yet what we need is the Lord and what he has given to us, his word, the Bible and his Holy Spirit. Neither those Colossian believers nor we today need anything new. We have all that we need. And Peter tells us that, doesn't he? We have all that we need for life and godliness. We simply need to grow in him. Jesus gave us the supreme example of this, making it his constant discipline to come away from the noise of the crowd and come alone to the Father. And it was there that the Father imparted to him strength for the task, a focus on what is truly important and a centering on the spiritual realm seeing things not as the natural man sees them, but so much deeper, with eternal perspective, with knowledge of the destructive influence of Satan and his many different snares and traps. And yet Jesus also had knowledge and a perfect relationship 
with the almighty heavenly father. His purposes, his perfect will, his completeness in himself being God. Paul prays that the Colossian church may have the knowledge of God's will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. God, the Holy Spirit, working through his word. Are we praying that for ourselves? Are we praying it for young believers? Are we praying it for old saints who've been journeying with Jesus along the narrow way for decades? If we lose sight of the spiritual, our lives can become all about duty or all about our effort, whether it leads to pride. Uh, it, can, we just, uh, it can lead to pride, which when we, we, uh, we do well and it's all about achievement, but actually far more often, it's far more likely that we don't achieve what we want to and we feel crushed because of our failure. All spiritual wisdom and understanding, how much we need that. We've looked at what Paul and Timothy pray. And now we look at why they pray, why they pray. Verse 10 says this, and we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way. A life worthy of the Lord. Live a life worthy of the Lord. We've seen just how we cannot do what pleases God until his Holy Spirit works within your life and my life. Before we go any further, just think of how amazing it is that we can please God and that we can live a life that's worthy of him at all. To be received by him, to be loved as Jesus is loved, as though we ourselves have always been perfect. That's incredible, isn't it? Even though we were once rebels who wanted nothing but our own way. This truly is amazing grace. There really aren't words big enough to do justice to what God has done. But we have this life and all eternity to praise him. Live a life worthy of the Lord. We can prove none of our spiritual depth until we live it out among the people. And this is why Paul prays for the Colossians. This is why we today should pray for ourselves and for other Christians to be filled with all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that we may live it out, that all the change on the inside of us that God is working on can then be seen on the outside in all that we say and do. God's gospel is a practical gospel. God's gospel is a holistic gospel. It changes the whole person inside and then out. I met a man a number of years ago who was appalled at football clubs putting replica football shirts on sale just for Joe Public to go and buy and wear around the high street or wherever he chooses. He told me that back in the 1960s, if anyone other than an actual team player was wearing the club shirt, they'd be thought of as an imposter, that it would be shameful to wear that unless you were really in the squad. No one but a team member was worthy of wearing that club shirt back then. Sometimes even club players today are booed at, told they're not worthy of that shirt when they do something that is thought of as not good enough. And we need to live lives worthy of the Lord as we wear the club shirt, as it were, of being in team Jesus. And whereas it is highly unlikely that the football team you support even knows of your existence, the Lord not only made you and knows every part of you, but he wants you to know him too. He's infinitely greater than any celebrity and yet we can spend as much time as we want with him. And more than that, more than that, he actually wants us to become like him and gives us every spiritual gift so that we can grow to be more like him. How will this be displayed in our lives? That's a part of verse 10 tells us, bearing fruit 
in every good work. Not good works, as though you or I can earn our salvation, but good work that shows God has already changed us, made us new inside, and that others get to see what God already sees. Growing in the knowledge of God. It is thrilling to see the appetite of a young Christian. You can't keep them away from their Bibles. They're always sharing of of new things they've discovered. They want to know more and more of the Lord. That's a wonderful thing. But that needn't be just for the young Christian. Pray that the Lord will give you a spiritual appetite like a young Christian all over again. He wants every one of his children to be hungry for more, for more of him, for more of his word, more of his spirit's power in our lives. Verse 11 continues with why Paul prays and why we pray. It says, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience. Well, whether it's people laughing at your trust in Jesus or extreme persecution that you might hear of in some parts of the world, every Christian needs great endurance and patience. Paul, in his second letter to Timothy, wrote that everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Some of these Colossian believers may even have been killed for their belief that Jesus, and not Caesar, is Lord. And yet every one of us in God's new family will need endurance through subtle temptations of our Western world, the desire for our comfort rather than Christ's glory. Patience with family members patience as we prepare for the return of the Lord Jesus. What God has done is incredible, which is why Paul says that we should be joyfully giving thanks to the Father. Our lives should be hallmarked with joy, not the critical culture we often see around us, but filled with joy from the Lord. If you are a true Christian believer, trust in Christ's death on the cross to pay for your every sin and believing that Christ rose up from the grave never to die again but to take his rightful place as king of heaven and earth and king of every heart then he has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints that is all who trust in him part of his new family and he's put his Holy Spirit within you. I don't believe any of us here were born into royalty. I don't think anybody watching this is part of the nobility, part of the aristocracy. But this this is actually something infinitely greater than being a prince or a princess or a lady or a lord here on earth. Because here we are, if we're in God's kingdom, his new family. We're perfectly loved children, heirs with Christ, of the kingdom of the glorious God and king of the universe. And what could be greater than that? In the last two verses of our prayer, we have a crescendo of testimony. Really, it is every Christian's testimony, rescued by God, from Satan's power into a new and glorious kingdom. It shows us once again God to be the champion, to be the victor, the one that we need, the one that we're satisfied by in our deepest, deepest needs. The hardest heart is broken when he shows us who he is and we're overwhelmed by the love of God the love God has for us and all that he's done for us. And we won't be able to stop ourselves sharing of all the amazing things 
that he has done in both the spiritual and the physical realms. Colossians 1, 13 and 14. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. A prayer for more, yes, because unless we grow in him, we stagnate, we slip back. And growth is where we all need to be. So pray. Pray for deeper communion with the Lord. Read to meet him there in his word. Rise up, get up, get out, obey, trust, love, serve. Make it a practical outworking of all he's teaching us and showing himself to be.